I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to the project Cosmos 1939, George Sal Walter Benjamin of uh, Jean-Michel Alberola that will take place at the Tiana Thomas' Theater uh, from September 2nd to the 29th of January, 2022. And I will present here at the Lange Nacht der Wissenschaft, the long night of the science, just uh, the project briefly. And then I, we will start an interview with the artists Aura Rosenberg, Francis Scholz and Chantal Benjamin that are also part of the project. So the exhibition Cosmos will be shown at the Tiernatomisches Theater, Hermann von Helmholtz Zentrum at the Humboldt University in Berlin Mitte um, with the inauguration on the 2nd September. And uh, from October uh, to July uh, 2018 and 2019, uh, the exhibition was already shown at the Centre Dominique Vivant de Nantes, that is uh, in the library uh, for museology and history of the Louvre in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Here you see a map of the Louvre and the entrance from the Pont des Arts. And uh, it was shown in this beautiful library. Um, where uh, the creators, uh, Françoise Dalex and uh, Françoise Mardrus, created the show with Jean-Michel Alberola, who was also co-creator. So this is really nice to work with this artist that is also very imaginative and really working with the room in some way. Uh, so for Berlin, we thought about including other works and other artists, and in particular, the video works of Aura Rosenberg and Francis Schultz, also the light in box installation of Chantal Benjamin, uh, that we will present uh, after this. So in Cosmos uh, 1939, which is an original project of Jean-Michel Alberola, the artist combines new graphic works, with you, which you see here, drawings, lithographs with historical books and photographs as well as archives, and for Berlin also with the collection of uh, the Humboldt University and also with the collection of the Eichenholz Sternwarte in Berlin, the observatory. So uh, Alverola understands cosmos really as a sort of presentation, a constellation of objects um, where the viewer can really uh, pass by and um, understand this as a constellation that bound together the philosophy of Georges Sall and Walter Benjamin, which were two great thinkers of the 20th century. Uh, so here in the center we have Georges Sall, which was the director of the Louvre and in the time where Benjamin was uh, in exile in Paris since 1933, he was uh, also the uh, creator of the East Asian department of the Louvre. So uh, Benjamin discovered the work of Sall through an exhibition at the Bibliothèque Nationale. This picture, um, we see Benjamin at the Bibliothèque Nationale, a picture taken by Giselle Freund, who was also in exile in Paris. And um, through uh, Giselle Freund, who introduced uh, Benjamin uh, to uh, Adrien Monnier, that was a beautiful and uh, very famous, important uh, bookseller at the time. She had a library in uh, Rue de l'Odéon uh, in the Quartier Latin in Paris, where uh, James Joyce uh, and Simone de Beauvoir passed by, for example. And um, so Adrien Monnier told, uh, told uh, Walter Benjamin to read absolutely this book that is called Le Regard by Georges Sall, that Georges Sall was published in 1939. And it was about the museum and about the look, the glance. In English, it's translated with the glance. And there is also a German translation of the book of 2001, The Blick, by Barbara Hebachera. And um, in Le Regard, Sal says, what connects all people on this planet, writes Sal, is the trained eye, which reshapes the world with every glance according to the scheme of its own cosmos. So he describes art um, and the act of viewing art as an organic experience, an almost culinary delight that can not only be found in the quiet halls of museum, uh, also of Universal Museum as the Louvre, but also strolling through the streets of Paris. And when Benjamin discovered this book, Le Regard, um, he was really impressed by it. And he, he wrote in a letter to Max Horkheimer, but also in the review that was um, La Gazette des Amis des Livres made by Adrien Monnier, he wrote that this essay resembled very much uh, his essay on the work of, of art in the age of its technical reproducibility of 1936. So that there were identical aspects in both works in the Le Regard and in uh, his essay. 
about art. So what Alberola tried to do in this exhibition was uh, to connect these two thoughts of these two great uh, thinkers, uh, even if Salo is not very known at this moment, they had this connection, they never met physically, but they had this intellectual similarities, let's say in their thoughts, and for Alberola this um, identical is uh, the understanding of art as a cosmic experience. So through art, you can experience a rebound with the cosmos and a cosmic union again um, for um, this both thinkers in the eyes of Jean-Michel Alberola. So what the artist did was to reconstruct also the library of uh, Walter Benjamin, which uh, he could not, uh, he, he could not, um, his precarious situation uh, didn't um, make him possible to maintain. So Benjamin, uh, um, since his exile, he was writing a personal list of the books he was reading every year. And in 1939, he wrote, you know, he read 53 books uh, that uh, Jean-Michel Alberola collected again in the original edition read by Benjamin with the bookseller Jean-Yves Lacroix in Paris. And here you see the lithographs made by Jean-Michel Alberola of the book covers that are presented in the exhibition Cosmos. And uh, you will also have the original books in the exhibition Cosmos. So Alberola tried to recreate this library of Benjamin that the exile and the precarious situation could not be possible to maintain for him and brought them back and now brings them back to Berlin, which was uh, the home city, the hometown of Benjamin and also at the university where Benjamin studied. So this is really symbolic act for the artist and that's why he wanted absolutely to bring them to Berlin after Paris. Um, so what comes uh, as well at the Tiana Tomasz's Theater is this combination with uh, art and science, art and Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt and his famous cosmos. So um, for him, it's, it's very important for the artist to connect also with the history of the Humboldt University. And that's why he chose some particular objects. Here left, we have a specimen of a starfish and uh, the a lithography with a scientific depiction of a starfish, as well as um, astrological maps of the observatory of Eichenholt. Um, so he wanted really to recreate um, this uh, connection between the micro and the macrocosmos uh, through the eyes of Benjamin and Sal in his view, that is a scientific and aesthetic contemplation of art. The cosmos and the art are linked uh, through the regard, through the, uh, the view, through the glance. So, um, there are also some photographs of uh, Giselle Freund and Sasha Stones uh, that are combined with lithographs and drawing. And this is like a sort of Gesamtkunstwerk where you can walk through. And what comes now is that uh, the artist also wanted to make this connection with or connect more with the history of, of Berlin and what is the understanding of Berlin of Walter Benjamin. So he invited the artist um, Aura Rosenberg, Francis Scholz, and Santal Benjamin to present their beautiful uh, video works uh, about uh, Berlin childhood around 1900. Uh, that uh, they will be shown in a separate room with a projection. And I'm very happy now to uh, start this small interview with the artists that are present today here. And by starting this, I will show you three parts of these videos, as well as some images of the light boxes of Chantal Benjamin. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Yet before I had to make up my mind, the entire panorama from which I was separated by a wooden partition trembled and the scene swaying in its little frame would exit left before my eyes. The arts that survived here became extinct in the 20th century as it began, they had their last audience in children. For them, distant worlds were not always alien. It might be that the desire these worlds awakened would call them not into the unknown, but home. One afternoon, I sought to convince myself, while viewing a transparency of the little town of X, that once, very long ago, I had played on the pavement, guarded by the ancient plane trees, 
of the Kur Mirabu. When it was raining, I would not stand outside before the list of 50 images. I'd find my way into the inner sanctum to discover, in fjords and beneath coconut palms, the same light that illuminated my desk while I did my homework in the evening. Unless, that is, a defect in the lighting of the panorama suddenly drained the landscape of color. Then it lay silent and withdrawn below an ashen sky, and it seemed that I would still have been able to hear the wind and the bells if only I had been paying more attention. Kaiser Panorama. Time you can remember, but can you remember? I remember the, thing? the first time. Yeah, what was it like? Well, I was like, Mommy, Mommy, come on, come on. Then you went with me, and I was like, Yeah, me. But the first time I went for myself, I was like, It's okay, um, Mom, I'll try it alone this time. But I was a bit like, um, Will I manage? <laughs> I'm, I'm scared. Um, it turned out to be really fun. Not that I don't like being with you. It gave me a bit more courage. Mm. The platform, with its obliging animals, rotates just off the ground. It has the elevation best suited for dreams of flying. The music starts up and the child moves away and jolts from his mother. At first he is anxious to be leaving her, but then he sees how he himself is faithful. He towers as a faithful ruler above the world that belongs to him. Trees and natives draw themselves up in formation on a tangent. Then his mother appears once again in an orient, after which a treetop steps forth from the primeval forest, as the child had already seen it thousands of years ago, and just now for the first time in the castle. I understand actually two ways. One is he dreamt thousands of years ago that he had seen it or something like that. Or like his ancestors maybe and saw it in, in the same perspective. Now he's seeing it again and feels something and thinks of that and stuff. Or he's just doing... Um, um, I call coincidence of time that um, it's like he imagines thousands of years ago. His animal is devoted to him. Like a mute Arion, he sweeps along on his mute fish. A wooden Zeus bull abducts him as an unblemished Europa. <laughs> These rough, tough crusaders go and play in a carousel and then do their swords whilst in a carousel going around and running around. I thought they were tough, not kids. <laughs> Mm 
very happy that you represent your great grandfather here. Because in a movie, as soon as there's a child in front of the camera, it's the same thing, it changes all the rules. Pour ça que je suis très content que Vata Benjamin est présent ici par toi. Thank you, Adolf World and the Kids World. And um, the kids um, usually don't know um, the things that are coming. Adults always want to know, yes, we're doing this and this, and the kids want to explore it and know and have a surprise about what's happening. The kids' dreams and the adults' dreams are very different. Like the adults have much more like with um, sophisticated things. The kids are more imaginative and they dream of things that they've never seen before and what they always wanted to do and stuff. Another thing? Yes. <laughs> um, the kids is like a temporary time. You only have it once, but the adult life in goes on and on and on until you die. So the kids' life is only once in a lifetime and much um, more wertvoll. And then, um, then in adults' life, because you um, you have it on and on and on. <laughs> Walter Benjamin n'aurait pas cru que son arrière-grande-fille parlerait ici à Porto. Maybe we can start by introducing the artist. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for inviting us. I'm Aura Rosenberg. I'm an artist who lives between New York and Berlin for about the last 30 years. And um, one very important project over that almost that many years has been Berliner Kindheit for me. And I guess we'll talk more about it when we get into really talking about the project. But I had the great luck to through that work to meet Chantal Benjamin about well how old is Laïs now Chantal? Laïs is now 15. She's oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah well I met She's Chantal teenager. the year before she was born so um and shortly after that we started um shooting recording um, so that's how long I've known Chantal. And then, um, well, I know Francis and I've really admired Francis's work for a long time. And when it became clear that the movie version of Berliner Kindheit was more than I could possibly do myself, I asked, Chant I asked um, Francis if she would work with me on it. So now we are like a, a team. Uh, Francis and me, and with Chantal and Laïs. So. Yeah, yeah, so uh, then I, I don't know, I take on Chantal, or you would like to go on? Shall I? I think, I think it makes sense that you carry on yeah. first, Francis. <laughs> yeah, so um, my name is Francis Scholz. I'm an artist. I'm living in Cologne. I'm teaching at the Hochschule für Bildende Künste in Braunschweig, the University of Arts in Braunschweig. I have a painting class and um, I'm also a filmmaker. And I was extremely honored when Aura, an artist I respect very much, asked me if I would collaborate with her on this project. And like she reminded me that I first was very hesitant, which is true because I wasn't sure actually what I could add to the realm of expression of Walter Benjamin in the arts, because there are a lot of uh, work, is a lot of work is done. But uh, I have to say Chantal, uh, you and Laïs, of course, inspiring, mesmerizing personalities, which I met, kind of um, also sucked me in besides the pro prospect of working with Aura for so long, because I kind of 
think, like you said, this huge uh, 42 um, storybook um, is a lifelong project. So uh, <laughs> the prospect of uh, exchanging uh, so much uh, thoughts and, and time, uh, mutual, spending so much mutual time kind of uh, encouraged me to say yes. And uh, I think all we, uh, we, we sat down and came, you know, created parameters and a structure for how to, to approach uh, this project and this uh, showed a lot of artistic freedom to me. So I, so I'm part of it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis. Um, so I'm, it has also been a pleasure to be in this project. Um, I owe the initiation and inception of this project to Aura. It was her impulse that um, brought it about, otherwise it would have never happened. And uh, it also has been a pleasure to do it with uh, Francis because I think, well, I'm going to say this, um, the fact that we were like four women working together, three at the beginning, I think has also an influence because I think it brought a certain sensibility to the project, um, perhaps wouldn't otherwise. And, as we know, uh, the issue of women um, in the arts and in the films um, is something that has been going on for quite a long time and an perspective I think it's also interesting. Um, because it's such a long haul project which um, has been going on over the past 15 years, there's an element of things evolving, different perspectives and inputs, which um, I think contribute to its richness. And obviously, Laïs, uh, my daughter, is um, very perceptive, um, as you saw in the clip as well, um, can represent a, a, a childhood perspective, is able to express that, which I think is also very interesting. Thank you very much. Already so many interesting um, things you said. And um, yeah, maybe uh, you can um, explain me, Aura, since this project started from you, actually, um, how, how did you come to, to discover this, this pieces of Benjamin, the Berlin childhood around 1900? Um, uh, fragments and what inter interested you about it? Why did you want to do this project so uh, impulsively or absolutely? And how how did you contact Chantal? How how did this uh, come to come into life? Well, for me, the project actually started in around 1992 when I first came to Berlin with my husband John Miller, who's an artist and our daughter who at that time was not even two years old yet. And John had received a um, DAD grant from the um, Berliner Kunstler program. And um, during that year, that first year here, I uh, met Klaus Biesenbach, who is uh, the founder of Kunstwerk Berlin, where I live. And he, um, I was just shooting pictures of my daughter Carmen and her kindergarten class, little black and white snapshots, the way um, all parents document their children's childhood. And Klaus saw these little black and white photos and said, let's do a show. And it was the very beginning of Kunstwerk at that time. And um, his uh, curatorial assistant suggested that we call it um, Berliner Kindheit and told me about the Benjamin text. Now, the my photographs had nothing to do with the text at that point. But after the show, I thought, well, maybe I should read them. And when I read them, I just became very interested. Um, and gradually, the idea to, sh because Benjamin is a, really writes in images, he really believes in images. And I knew very little about Benjamin at this point even though my name is Aura, which is a, like a central idea for Benjamin. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> just a strange coincidence among with 
many strange coincidences in the process of doing this work. Um, so I started to look to images in the text and think, well, maybe I could photograph them with my own daughter and her friends and places that he talks about. So it's kind of looking at um, the Berlin of 1900 through the lens of contemporary Berlin, through a contemporary childhood. And um, that, that project really evolved. And of course, I learned a lot about Benjamin's ideas through doing this, not only through reading Benjamin, but through actually working with the images that his texts evoke. And eventually I received a grant from the DAAD as well to finish this project and produce a book of the photographs along with the text. We were never able to publish um, Ben Newman's texts. We never were able to get the rights to them, but we could use fragments from them along with a, with a sort of a diary that I wrote myself of the photographs that I was taking. And I guess a subtext to much of this was also my own family history. My own family fled Germany after living here for hundreds of years. In, they left in 1939 to go to the United States. So that is not so in the front of what I'm doing, but it is a kind of subtext. And my father came to visit and he, he appeared in some of these photogra early photographs. So that was kind of a completed project. And, and after that, I, I was also interested in working with another image of Benjamin's, the angel of history in his last thesis on the philosophy of history. Um, it was his last text and written in a very dark moment. Um, as in a way, so was Berliner Kindheit begun in 1932 when Benjamin left Berlin fearing that he would never return. But after I had completed Berliner Kindheit, I thought, well, I would like to do something with this other image that Benjamin talks about, which was actually based on a Paul Clay watercolor, the angel of history, Angelus Novus, which belonged to Benjamin. He owned that image of Paul Clay's. And he wrote about the angel of history, who's um, kind of observing the catastrophe of history and progress. Um, after I finished that work, I got an email, a very intriguing email from Chantal Benjamin, and um, that she'd like to meet and, and talk about this work. And she was moving to Berlin, really, I think the only one of the four granddaughters to move to Berlin to learn more about her grandfather, but not just learn about him, but like in a way, move to the city that he loved, where he was born. Chantal and Laïs are not only narrating this, they're not blank slates that we're just projecting um, Benjamin's narrative onto. They are very much people in their own right, with their own ideas and their own kind of understanding of these texts, but they also embody them in a very concrete way. So um, that's kind of the way that I started on Berlin Childhood as a, as a movie, you know, then Chantal had Laïs a year later after we met, and it just seemed like shooting home movies, you know, this adorable little baby, like I have tons of, I have more footage of Laïs and of my own daughter, I think, so maybe. Um, and, uh, and, and it just went on. We, we had wonderful summer summers together, going out to Fawaninsel and going to the zoo and going to hear the Blesch Kapelle in the zoo and really, um, you know, reliving a lot of the things that Benjamin was describing. And then um, we realized it was such a big project. And as I said before, um, turned to Francis who's done such beautiful um, movie work on her own and uh, felt a real sympathy towards her work and um, asked her to be part of it. And, and she really uh, fits, she fits with us. So that's a history of Berlin Akintai. That's such a beautiful story. And it's so it's so similar to, to Jean-Michel Berola also. I mean, it's always like, uh, some encounters that 
um, that are a bit par hasard, uh, not not uh, not programmed, and then uh, connections build up, and there are so many personal connections with the work of Benjamin, and it's really beautiful to hear this. Thank you so much for this for sharing this. Um, so maybe we can ask uh, Frances how it was for her to to be part of this project when she started to get to be part of this project how many videos did you already make or or did you have the footage and then started uh, to cut it with Frances when she came in or how how this this did this collaboration um, start um, uh, practically mm. I'm not quite sure did you do didn't you do the butterfly film already as part of this but uh, I think in the connection with Chantal and Laïs you had collected a lot of footage and uh, we had glances on it you talked about it but I think we kind of marked a new step together is that right Lisa? absolutely so yeah. we we said okay let's make a movie series out of it, a film series, and uh, said, like I said before, figuring out some structures and some parameters, how this could work. And um, to, to, to have a formal uh, idea as well, uh, besides the immense content and uh, working together with Chantal and Laïs, who is living a Berlin childhood, which, also produced an intense urgency of the project because a childhood is not endless and she is now already a teenager and the perspectives are changing, which is also interesting. I mean, she always had this meta view on the whole thing, even if she was six. This, this is the incredible thing, but maybe we come later to that. So that, that closes the whole circle back to Benjamin. No but uh, to Walter Benjamin. We had the idea that Laïs will be reading the text uh, even from the beginning when she was just learning to read, which was pretty impressive, like how trying adding, putting words together to make sense and she's trying to understand at the same time and learning reading while we working with her. So um, there you also see this, um, this progression through the whole movies, her growing up, like um, making documenting her actually growing into this teenager, this to this soon woman. And um, it was so interesting to me because at the moment we entered it, we didn't find these travel images, these dreamlike travel images Walter Benjamin saw and talked about. We saw the documentation of the wall coming down. And what we saw also in the slides and the images, you saw her. So it kind of circles back and everything also like in my life and what Aura said and Chantal, also about Chantal, it all connects us to the past and, and the, the text of Walter Benjamin. Our experience also in the now. No? Mm. So what is it, was it a critique of this society you were trying to do or, or what Aura said before, it was a sort of embodiment and a re, a reenactment, I don't know, uh, to live through this, to this memories again uh, with a critical view of Walter Benjamin on today's society or was it more uh, like a spontaneous um, um, view of, of this society through the texts of Benjamin, but with a different outcome, as you told us, Francis, with the uh, images you, you found in Imperial Panorama were different. So how did you react to this and, and what did you like about this or what difficulties you had to, to deal with this different contemporaneities of end of 1800s, beginning of the 20th century and now today's postmodern world? What were the clashes you found and what did you want to achieve with your project? Um having between the lines are very, very political because we have to have in mind that he wrote these texts in exile during the rise of the Nazi time and the threat and dreadful situation, so which was ever present for him. 
what you're saying is that I, I don't feel we have a particular agenda, a particular point of view that we're trying to assert with these movies. We're just, you know, recording what is in front of us. And what is in front of us has some very interesting parallels to the past. Um, it, sometimes it seems very, very similar, like a kind of uh, desperate refugee situation, you know? Um, but also it can be very different. And um, actually, uh, Francis and I were talking about this last night, for example, one movie right now that we're working on, The Fish Otter, um, which for Benjamin in the zoo, this was a very kind of dark, mysterious creature. And he loved to go to the zoo in the rain, like a really kind of melancholic uh, atmosphere. When we went with Laïs to the zoo, she was singing about how she loves the sun and she hates the rain, you know, a very different, like a, you might almost say a sunny childhood, right? And, and the fish otters, unlike this gloomy creature that Benjamin describes, were like little Disney kind of chirpy creatures. Like we were laughing about it. It's, it's a real contrast to what Benjamin's describing, but it's what is right now. And, and Francis said to me last night, well, maybe, you know, he had this kind of dark feeling about the creature because of the time he was writing it, the kind of darkness that was hanging over him, um, which is, I think, very, very possible about all of the texts, you know, that the, so, but it's not that we're looking to put any particular point of view forward. It's just putting these two um, realities I, next to one another. Yeah, thank you, Aura. But now I'm kind of coming back to what I wanted basically to say was him um, incorporating between the lines this political background, um, writing out of exile and the situation he was in. So they, this is, was kind of for me or for us an encouragement also, like to create meaning and to understand how to make visible what has been erased and with what is not seen or what is not visible. And uh, so being more open for seeing these things which probably happen are happening on the edges of our frames and while we are editing we maybe detect things so we we are getting through him more sensitive to bringing things more in the foreground mm. which maybe help us understand our society now where there are definitely parallels to the past and where society has to be more sensitive recognizing those, you know? It's like about learning how to recognize what you see. And this is a process for us while we are editing the film, but also maybe later for the viewer. Yeah, a, I mean, a, ben, uh, Benjamin does talk about like sort of uncovering um, lost histories or histories that were never recorded. Um, and rubbing history against the grain. So yeah, oh, he was an exchange with Hannah Arendt. I, I think so. Knowing about her ideas with the forgotten history, the real history, which is the the forgotten, the burden, the the buried one, which we can maybe make visible. Yeah, throughout. But I think that's more. I, I mean, I I don't know. I shouldn't speak for for Francis and Chantal, but I feel like that's more something that we discover, uncover, rather than purposefully go out to record. Like we just take a kind of um, somewhat neutral position to the camera. I mean, there is also, you know, this is another Benjaminian idea about the optical unconscious, the things that happen inside the frame that you may not even be aware of as you're shooting it, but only later recognize. Um, and I think yeah. we've, we've all had that kind of um, experience. Like, yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I kind of like to to add to that. I, I think beyond the concept of wanting to transmit the text and have them read sort of literally into the word, 
there's, I mean, there, there are two words that I think have like a going a, con a continuum through this exhibition and the project. And this is the question of connection, uh, whatever the connection may be between the present and the past, uh, between themes, between political situations, childhood, adulthood. There's a thing that these are the sort of co connections and also uh, something that has also been hinted at, um, situations of coincidence. The issue of coincidence appears a lot with people who either are, you know, working with Benjamin or Benjamin's ideas or whether, or you have mentioned that, you know, when you were dealing with Benjamin, you also had um, as, um, lots of coincidences that occurred also. And also our meeting, um, and um, there is an element of that that pursues. Um, and I think the, the same is happening with uh, also uh, the exhibition at the TRT. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I think I would say that the work is, has an element of, although um, we're, part of it was following the text literally and trying to be true to the text in, se in the sense of the text being um, completely read out, but also and using um, locations that were originally there as much as possible, uh, there is an openness uh, to the filming. I mean, there wasn't a structured gender um, in, in the sense that, you know, we'd already decided this image is going to be happening. And um, yeah, so, and also I think it allowed perhaps also for Laïs to put her perspective of a child also and her input and her reactions to what she could understand of the text as she was growing up. Um, and what she was uh, living um, by investigating the places, the images, the situations at the level um, as she was growing up. Yeah, Thank you very much. I mean, one thing I should say is that one of the parameters of the movies, it's not 100%, but is that they're shot in Berlin. Um, not not always. Sometimes it, it doesn't make sense, like with the moon, you know, is not necessarily about Berlin. But um, but as far as possible, like we really try to hold to that. That the footage be shot here. So maybe I, I can ask you, uh, how did you choose this per particular Berlin locations? Uh, because sometimes um, there are some like in the, in the part we saw of Carousel, uh, you associate the, the, um, the moving of uh, the clock in the Alexanderplatz with the moving of the Carousel, the turns, and then uh, you have this beautiful view of the tree. Uh, so maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more how you, you chose the locations and how did you associate certain images and other not also uh, for the video of, uh, for example, uh, Imperial Panorama, where the panorama starts to fly in the, in the sky, uh, which is really beautiful. So there are also uh, some um, less realistic moments, a bit abstract moments and uh, more science fiction moments. And this, this would, be interest, would interest me uh, on how you deal with this. How did you choose this particular uh, images or uh, um, locations and uh, what how did they re relate with with the texts of Benjamin or don't I mean they don't have to relate well we were really looking for a carousel right Chantal <laughs> we were like on the lookout for a carousel in Berlin and um, every uh, late summer I think the carousel comes to um, right near the Gedächtniskirche, yeah. It was also in, it's funny, it's in um, Christmas Angel also, I think it's the same carousel that appears in, in uh, Christmas Angel. So, so that was what dictated that location pretty much that, you know, where we could find a carousel. And, and that wasn't so easy to shoot because um, we got in kind of trouble. 
sometimes shooting um, on the carousel. Um, and then I think Alexander plots, I mean, it's this kind of um, the idea of the eternal return, you know, the child um, kind of recognizing things. And Alexander plots was just a kind of, I don't know, a poetic license. Uh, I live near Alexander Plotz and uh, thought what, what, you know, that would make a good location for spinning around um, and the trees where the Benjamin talks about. So, I mean, I think that um, Francis and I feel a lot of liberty to work with these texts. I have no idea how Benjamin would feel about what we I mean, have done with his text, you know? But. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I always, even if I misinterpret it, there is one part in his introduction of Walter Benjamin in German, where he kind of, I don't know exactly how he puts it, but he says kind of, he would be curious how my interpretation is that, how other generations, and he often talks of his text as images which is very important. So, which is an inspiration for me or probably for us that he already puts his, into, puts his text into a visual realm. And uh, so that he kind of would be, he says something like he would be curious to see how coming generations would see or imagine this or put it into new images. So, um, kind of for me like a encouragement to even create something out of his text and um, to answer like for instance you also mentioned imperial um, panorama what these el more fictional elements come from and I also think it was not so far away from the text because he talks of these travel scenes which are passing by in front of him and um, and then he he kind of they, they depict distant worlds so which are enabling him enabling him to dream a, a way into foreign worlds and uh, this was an inspiration also for fictional elements to um yeah he's kind of reaching out of reality into a poetic world and i think this creates for me or for us windows out of reality into fiction as well so, uh, and uh, yeah. like Aura said, also the general uh, freedom of film and the possibilities, you know, when you, I mean, it's not a painting, it's a film and it has all these, uh, especially in this digital media we are using, you have all these possibilities to um, leave certain facts and enter some, or explore some new spaces and going more towards the cosmos, maybe. <laughs> and, and also I, just, just I'm sorry, uh, Chantal, can I just say this and then you, you jump in? Um, that um, when Francis brings up those images, I was really surprised as I started to learn more about Benjamin through like photographing the text um, that he describes them as a series of snapshots of a childhood in a turn of the, a bourgeois childhood in turn of the century Berlin. So he also saw them as snapshots and I think photography and, and, and film was very important to Benjamin. But, um, but Chantal, why don't you, um, you finish what you were gonna say? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, although I think Aura, you, you, it was very important from you from the beginning to stay quite true to the text um, and um, I don't think that Benjamin was such a literal person that's my interpretation personal interpretation and um, so I think um, however that is uh, portrayed is valid um, then it's a, a question of um, a subjective uh, approach to something and uh, I personally find it, um, I like it when we see the Kaiser panorama, the shots that um, um, Francis brought in. Um, 
her perspective and sensibilities. And I, that's what I think is really interesting when you have more than one person or you have a collaborative work um, and things evolve, you have different perspectives and you can uh, appreciate perhaps things that hadn't, uh, weren't originally part of a vision or a, an idea and, and watch that evolve and, and, and uh, go, and express themselves differently. I mean, I'm quite personally, I'm quite open to that. I don't, um, yes, and I and I don't think that um, there is only one interpretation of feelings or nostalgia or yeah, yeah so uh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting to hear. And uh, I think also maybe fictional elements, maybe they they are also able. The, I know we want to be in the now always and work on that, maybe everybody in our days, but incorporating fictional elements kind of also maybe frees you sometimes from the now and enables you to connect with the past or the future, whatever, you know, in both direction. And I think this, this idea maybe connect with Walter Benjamin as well. Like, I don't know, wanted to support what Chantal said, like, that, that he probably would be open as well. No? And, and I think that we're very open also to Chantal and Laïs who are, are really the, uh, you know, featured in the movies and, and are um, people full of ideas and, and emotions and like we're responding to that as well. And something that couldn't have been anticipated um, if you're just following the text that there would be this intersection then. Um, mm with these real, you know, people, these descendants of Benjamins who in a way um, embody his, his words. So, and also, I mean, one thing that strikes me is we're working over quite long distances. I mean, I'm here in the summertime for the most part, but you know, then I'm in New York and uh, Chantal is in Berlin and Francis is in Cologne. And so we're kind of also triangulating space that way. Very beautiful. Thank it's very you. pandemic. <laughs> I, I, you know, I. The word needed to go great. You brought the word in that we know at what time we are now. I mean, I, I think there's a thing you mentioned before, Aura, which I think happens to many artists in various um, uh, whatever medium they use, is that often you might be doing something and you don't really. Um, realize whilst you're in the process of doing it or why you may be choosing or doing that and then it's only later with hindsight that you notice that it has a particular significance or it may be other people that project a significance onto it that may not have been intentional or at least not consciously um, decided at the time you mm -hmm. know and that's Absolutely. And, and, and I think that's a, a thing that many, perhaps not all, but many artists um, experience, I would say, uh, and yeah, can be part of the process. Yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe also the technique of the montage, which uh, is maybe also interesting to, to look at once what kind of genre we are working in. And I think it's hard, uh, we are kind of escaping a categorization because we are having a montage of documentary elements and fictional elements and, uh, and even science fictional elements like with things flying off or um, so this, um, also brings the, the the viewer in a dreamlike maybe landscape and and um, creates certain effects where you can't. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just thinking now of the the, the film The Moon, which is also yeah. no, this uh, is a really important point you're bringing up. But going to be seen like uh, in 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 the um, text for about the moon, like Benjamin felt infected by thoughts like the which are. Uh, culminating like kind of in a transfer part real part fiction so um and also our um we are working in these boundaries these lines between documentation and narration and escaping this categorization of generic 
designations and and uh, yeah. Well, I, and, I, I think keep that, it open. Yeah, no, but this point you brought up about montage is very important because as much as Benjamin like liked to write sort of imagistically, he also thought about film techniques like film editing yep. so that he was writing, thinking about, let's say a close up shot, a panning shot, a wide angle shot. I mean, these were all in his mind as he put his text together very much in this montage technique of movies. Which, mm -hmm. you know, is which the, creates is new meaning, form. you know, which you can't, what, what uh, Chantal nicely mentioned, that you can't foresee things, that it appears in the creative process. And this has a lot of, to do with intuition too, you know, and, and being able to wear and see at that moment while you do it. And I think this approach we have, I mean, me, it reminds me a little bit on, on the painting process, even not in the, in the, strong, serious way of filmic work, being more open for the moment, like giving, like for instance, Chantal and Laïs, I think Aura and me, we are doing that when they're in front of the camera, giving them all the space and giving them also the chance, the opportunity to alter the whole film, you know, and not sticking with the text in a, in a way fulfilling what he had said, but intervening and, and creating a friction probably, you know, and not proving something. It's not a scientific work we are doing, you know, it's an artistical work and it's in a work about life. You know, the, the, the actually liveliness of the person in front of the camera, which, which we allow, or I think we allow to alter and in one, in one point, and then later the montage, the technical part, the artistical part, which is also able to alter the whole context again. <laughs> I'd like to pick up on your point, um, Francis, about intuition. And I think um, Aura has, I mean, from the very beginning, I always notice, and I think Aura has a very intuitive um, approach to Benjamin and, a, and, and an intuition and insight, I would say, well, when it comes to Benjamin's work or, or um, you know, how, how she intuitively interprets certain things. And also you have also sensibility and an intuition with, with the camera. Um, and I'm going to throw in again, I think um, perhaps this uh, liberty and giving the space to a child, uh, you know, as Lais was participating in or is participating in this project um, is also probably more generous because it also is coming perhaps from a more female perspective. I mean, it really comes. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I hope you were finished. I didn't want to interrupt. No, you can say, and then there's one last point. I'm yeah, all, sorry. I'll make yeah, no, point. I just, maybe it also comes because our and, and me, you know, we are not filmmakers in this severe sense. You know, we are more coming from the arts, if you have to make any di divided into these different parts. But maybe we are bringing another experience with us, you know, from other media. Yeah, but, but I, think, I think Chantal really raises an interesting point, though, which is something I don't often think about for some weird reason, but Laïs is embodying the words of a, or the experiences of a young boy. You know, I don't think about that really. Um, so we so, thought about it in sexual awakening <laughs> yeah true true yes but um but maybe and some maybe that shows in a way our our kind of a sense of freedom as women that we don't like it doesn't hang over us like oh that was a boy talking about that you know it's not something we really discuss with one another but I'm really glad that you brought it up Chantal because I it's, mm. you know this may, maybe makes out all the universality of your project. I mean, it's very universal. You can apply to every child. I, what I wanted to say very quickly as a last point is the acoustics, um, because I think not only was Benjamin very visual, but I think 
because he has a uh, Benjamin has quite a sort, sort of poetic style and I think he was very aware of acoustics outside the fact that he also did the the radio sessions um, I think acoustics plays a, quite an important role and in some of um, the films that are being shown and even like we saw in the Kaiser panorama the also the ringing of the bell and and so you have also different acoustics you have sort of the acoustics of the past that um, are portrayed but you have also present acoustics because the acoustics do change throughout time um, so that's also um, I think an important part yes and and that's another important uh question I think um, the music is, is very present in your works and it, it's a very poetic way of underlining some images and, and some texts. Francis you want to talk about your choices of music? Yeah I mean yeah we, we um, yeah there are definitely like you already mentioned different approaches so I think first of all I think sound is uh, and, and music is a very crucial element in film because in this media we are able to create while these two elements meet or connect something third where you also can alter alter the meaning of of the film and uh, and also Lai's voice uh, has a similar effect I think it's it's a very strong part using that and I think uh, one part is like I could say this the music element supports the the collaborative element in our films in our work because we we uh, for instance invited one young Berlin musician Maximilian Boss he's living in Berlin and he's one part of the band known to young mostly young people in uh, Easter with Stina Omar or we we collaborated with Robert Kienberg alias Milkblatt so we have uh, different mu contemporary musicians in the film and uh, have different ways of using the music in, in one time, like we had him uh, produce the score for the whole film, or sometimes we take music which already exists and combine it in, in the film with the images or to different extents, the, the musician, or like for instance, Maximilian Boss gets a freedom to, uh, to, to create for the films. So, and, and all, um, I mean, maybe you like to, to add the way you yeah. use more classical music. Yeah, I, um, I haven't commissioned any work the way that, that Francis has been doing. Um, but for example, the scene going around Alexanderplatz, well, that music was playing in Alexanderplatz. I, I found a, a better, you know, quality recording of it, um, but, uh, that's just a trace of what was actually there. Um, but then in another movie, for example, that isn't in our collection that we're showing, um, but it's about the uh, Benjamin's early encounters with death called Two Riddles or Two Puzzle Pictures. And um, as a child, my father gave me uh, Gustav Mahler's um, Kinder Totenlieder, Songs on the Death of Children. So that I was looking for something that could go with this story about um, the first child he falls in love with who, um, who dies. And that just seemed like the right music to um, go with that text. And, and then the text also talks about um, a military music that he's learning in school, the other the other part of the puzzle picture, like what does it mean to give your life for your country? And um, that was Wallenstein. And so that was an, a simple one, just to use the music that Benjamin was actually talking about. So, but also, I, and I think Francis would agree with this, that having music um, also just in a very um, camp, in, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In terms of like editing, it, it gives music gives you a kind of tempo to edit to as well. So it really helps in 
ordering and editing the images. And as Benjamin also talks about um, in, what text was it? I think it's Zika Zola where he's talking about, oh no, it's two brass bands where he's talking about the music of the brass, these two different kinds of brass bands, one of them playing to the ice skaters, but the other one is more like a military band and how it manipulates people's feelings, how music really manipulates people's feelings. And I think we all have experienced that where you can listen to something and it's very emotional or very rousing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we're maybe sometimes taking advantage of that as well, wanting to reach out to the people who are watching the movie and touch them with the music as well. Thank you. That's very beautiful. So it combines the way Benjamin sees music, uh, understands music, uh, his narrative and uh, your own personal experiences or what you wanted to, to pass to the viewers. Uh, yeah, very nice. Thank you for this. And maybe we can um, conclude or start to conclude this conversation by by asking uh, Chantal Benjamin more about her personal experience of of um, filming these parts in Berlin with you and how she came to rediscover a bit uh, her grandfather's work and why she was motivated to return to Berlin. And then we can talk a bit briefly about her uh, lightbox installation that uh, can also be very good, uh, can be connected very good to the uh, work Alberola did with his books, uh, with the recollection of the books of Benjamin and also the theme of the childhood that is um, very important for this um, installation. And also that I might add that in Berlin childhood, many of the texts are, um, involved with uh, reading and, and Benjamin's love of books. So it totally makes sense that Chantal uh, chose that as the, the subject for the light boxes. And it really connects to Berlin childhood in a very you know, strong way. Hmm. Yeah, so I will address, uh, I will hop back slightly to, to the film and, uh, and, and childhood. I think it's uh, basically, I see it as a voyage of discovery and I think for Lais as well. Um, and um, a process, I guess, for Lais of growing up. Uh, I think it's a theme that haunts me um, what it means for a child to be discovering through text and images about her past um, family uh, through doing this work. And it's a kind of inside out, um, both emotionally, physically, and it's feeling you were talking at the beginning and we're asking, um, well, I guess it's, it's tactually feeling things because we're going to locations um, we're feeling the places, seeing, touching, uh, it's visual, um, there's the element of colors, the smells, uh, there are all sorts of, um, I mean, it's very three-dimensional for, for Lais to be approaching the books or the stories, the anecdotes inside um, Berliner Kindheit. Uh, and she's really feeling um, sort of, well, it, I guess it's, it's, it's a three-dimensional experience of looking at uh, nostalgia as well, feelings of nostalgia. And yes, I'm not sure what, what the outcome will be for her as an adult, I can't say. We'll have to ask her um, what that means and, and how she, you know, interprets it all and has assimilated it and incorporated it into her life. And we were talking about interpretation and elements of imagination as well. I mean, as a childhood's perspective, um, an adult's perspective of childhood involved. Uh, so 
there, there's a mixture of perspective, fictional, non-fictional, biographical elements, um, present, modern, past. So it, it is, uh, I would say, um, uh, an interesting mixture. I hope it's an interesting mixture for people who watch it. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the first part, but I would say I would sum it up both, uh, yeah, discovery and understanding. The for me personally, the texts, um, and I think uh, when I look at it, when I look at the films, obviously as as a as a mother. Also, it's very interesting to see this process um, with, of, of a child growing up within this semi-fictional biographical setup. You know? It's, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's unusual. Yeah. It's I think it could be, I mean, I, I, there I have to uh, both um, thank um, Aura and Francis for allowing it to be natural and, and giving those moments um, to Laïs. And it's actually interesting, I think uh, Laïs highlights, perhaps that's something that we as adults underestimate, how much uh, children can perceive and um, have uh, an intuition or a presence of, uh, of what situations can be, and uh, perhaps we underestimate that. Um, so that's had something that we need to think of as adults when we consider how children view the world around them. So anyway, I'll jump on to the next bit and um, to do with the light boxes. Well, we talked about lots of coincidences and um, I, it was a semi stumbling upon um, being able to see the collection of uh, the private um, children's books collection in, in which now sits at uh, the University in Frankfurt. It's able to take photographs. It was a rapid moment between um, giving talks um, in a seminar, uh, but uh, well, afterwards, when I took uh, the images, um, it occurred to me that uh, they're not easily accessible to the public because the books are unfortunately not in a, the best, sort of, they're not all very well preserved. So you can't sort of just go and touch and look at them. And um, so I thought, well, how can we make that accessible uh, to the public? And um, so part of the idea was to, to be able to, to, to allow more people to see um, these images. Um, and also, I, I think the images show, well, they're also a, a snapshot of time um, because they are mostly of books of the late 1800s, some a bit earlier, mid, mid 1800s to late 1800s. Um, and they show how, first of all, how that we interpreted or viewed childhood at the time. So I would say it was very much linked, um, the images that we see very much linked to the um, Victorian moors that the uh, children were considered as mini adults. Uh, both in how they would, would behave um, and how they were expected to behave and how they were trained into adulthood. Um, and then you can also see um, in connection to, well, we're, the, the, this, exhibitioning is, this exhibition is happening at the TRT, so which the Tier Anatomisches Museum was a veterinary college and um, I took a lot of images from a natural history book of the time. And um, so I think um, that also for me made sense. So here you see Naturgeschichte. And you can see also in, in those days that um, like there are very sort of um, human expressions given to the animals. 
or in the case we don't have it here, but if you come across it, the, the images of the lions, um, you will see that um, people probably didn't see always lions, although here is quite a good one, but there are other images of lions which really are more of a fantasy or, or an idea of what a lion may look like. And some of the animals that were illustrated, you can see, you, you get a strong impression that they were illustrated according to what had been described rather than what had been seen. Uh, so, yes. Um, and yeah, and also because it belonged, it's, it's also a personal thing and a sort of family um, heirloom. And as uh, Alberola um, very kindly allowed us to participate in this exhibition, um, it, to me it made sense. It made sense that since he also had um, the book covers, um, and he'd done, he has done these lithographs that um, it kind of unites the theme of childhood, books, um, the space in which this exhibition is taking place. Um, yes, so, yeah. It's very interesting that you, you chose the medium of the light box for this because um, the idea of le regard, the glance that uh, Georges Salle uh, wrote in his book and that interested Benjamin in Georges Salle um, philosophy was this viewing and this experience of the cosmos through the view so that you show through this uh, monocles that you can have access to this scientific world that is mixed with fantasy, as you said, the idea that these animals were a bit fantastic and brought about with imaginations, but also in a kind of scientific approach. This links, I think, everything together uh, and can be like the final point of the exhibition because it's the child book experience, the childhood experience of Benjamin, his, his interest in collection, and also the thing that connects Benjamin and Sal, that is the glance, that is le regard. So through looking, through the uh, art, um, can be perceived uh, as a cosmic experience. And, and in this way, I think that your installation is, is very punctual and, and perfect to be shown at, uh, in this uh, third room. So we are very happy that, that we got uh, the opportunity to show this as well. This is really nice. Thank you so much for this talk. It has been uh, very beautiful. And um, I just want to conclude in thanking all the partners that support us in this exhibition, um, which are in particular the TAT team, uh, Marlene Bart, who helped us with all the te technical um, support and then um, um, Anna Söke of the Tienatomisches Theater, Felix Sattler, that was very enthusiastic about the project since the beginning when we started to talk about it in 2019. And um, then we, we wanted to thank the Centre Dominique Vendenon that uh, enabled us to bring this exhibition to, to Berlin and uh, the Humboldt University, uh, the Association of the Friends um, of uh, IDEM, that is a printing company in Montparnasse that printed all the lithographs of uh, Jean-Michel Alberola. And uh, we want to thank uh, the Fondation Antoine de Galbert that fin financed the exhibition in the first, first place. And um, particularly the Institut Francais and the French Ministry of Culture that um, helped us now financially. And we are very happy that they can be our partners and um, also all the institutions of the Humboldt University which uh, who supported us, like the Verein für Förderung des Institut für Kunst und Bildgeschichte. So I'm very grateful uh, that this can be um, finally shown hopefully in September after this uh, long period <laughs> without art and culture or very little for us all. So um, I'm looking very forward to the opening and I hope that uh, it will take place as planned. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>